Welcome, Alyssa. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> Alyssa, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? How, you, how did you get into uh, the Minneapolis City Planning Commission? How did you probably become an architect? How did you start your firm? I know we have a million questions. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> well, that's a, that's a that could eat up a long time. Uh, uh, long story short, I became an architect because uh, because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer as a kid, and then I I joined debate and thought I didn't like the research, and then by the time I figured out I liked the research, I had already settled on being an architect. So I didn't know any architects. I I didn't know uh, the day to day grind, um, and probably a good thing I didn't. So yeah, so that's that's how I kind of got on that trajectory, and then I'm you know, went to school for it. And that's the history. Um, I live in North Minneapolis and I um, was at a national night out and my neighbors found out I was in school for architecture at the time. I was finishing my master's <clears throat> and they said, you have to join our, our housing committee. You have to, you know, and uh, so I did. And that one thing led to another. Um, there, I was actually, I think the only, only architecture person, I wasn't licensed yet, only architecture person uh in my actual neighborhood in Hawthorne uh so um I was on a housing committee with a bunch of people and uh I was the only one who had uh design background but that was great because it was a great chance to you know learn about how the community perceived design and then I could help I hate to say translate I was almost like a translator <laughs> um and then that led to uh being uh asked to represent them on a, a steering committee for a small area plan for a community and that led to a city planner asking me to serve on the zoning board of adjustment and that led to me being recruited to the Minneapolis planning commission which I'm condensing this down because I could explain it forever but um, since then I served under three mayors and uh, for over 12 years uh, and and ultimately just finished my last term this past January so just half a year ago not even so so. Congratulations, that's a big accomplishment. <laughs> oh, well, I, I didn't intend it to be. I didn't think it would be that long of a thing, but here we are. That's wonderful. So um, you were talking about, just a minute ago, about um, being a, a North... North Sider, yep, sorry. North yeah. Sider, yep. Uh, can you tell me a bit, tell us a bit more about Minneapolis? I've never been, I wish I've been to Minneapolis, but can you <clears> tell us <throat> about the big city in um, the north side? And how, how, what is the, the dynamics of the scale of the big city in the north side? What, what does the scale look like? And, and socioeconomics. Sure. So um, when I say I'm a Northsider, it means that I, I've lived for over two decades in North Minneapolis. Um, in Minneapolis, okay, this is going to confuse people because if you think of North Minneapolis, you think of just up. But if you visualize Minneapolis and you break it into quadrants, the Northwest quadrant is called North Minneapolis and the Northeast quadrant is called Northeast Minneapolis. Don't ask me why we're not the Northwest. We're just, we're North. Um, and then and then there's South Minneapolis, which is broken into um, Southwest. And anyway, so um, so I'm in the, the North Quadrant, which is you know from nine to noon on a clock. If you think about that piece of the pie, um, North Minneapolis um, has a really interesting history. Um, but the thing that it gets most often um, kind of known known for by our city when people talk about North Minneapolis, they're usually using us as a poster child to talk about um, any number of things. Uh, we're one of the most, well, we are the most uh, diverse quadrant of the city. Uh, um, the rest of Minneapolis is fairly um, homogenous. I mean, we have diversity throughout, but but by and large, uh, most uh, the most diverse quadrant is North Minneapolis. We have the second most, which isn't a quadrant, but is a part of it is Phillips Powder, or a, um, yeah, a powder horn. So, uh, we, we, you know, when, when people talk about access to green space or, transit or park space or education or you know whatever we're the we're the kind of um desert in that regard we have the food desert we um we're a tight community but we're really underserved and underfunded uh and really underestimated i think so um that so so if you're not familiar with it just think about you know a big city in an area of a big city where if you wanted to say that neighborhood that would be my neighborhood um which is not that neighborhood but it's awesome so but but 
just so people get their head wrapped around it. It's it's not the rich uh, corner of the world, if that makes any sense. I don't know, I'm trying to like dumb it down so people can kind of visualize it in their head of what what their perceptions and expectations are, because that's usually what people perceive my area of the world to be like. So what does the architecture look like? Is it sprawl? It's definitely, it's a city. It's definitely not sprawl. What is the average density, let's say, like townhouses? Um, so this is really interesting. So um, North Minneapolis, uh, back in the, well, okay, so we have three major commercial corridors in North Minneapolis, the primary one being West Broadway Avenue. Uh, and West Broadway Avenue is actually along an old, uh, it, it kind of swerves up and down. It originally um, was Native American trails to get to the river, and then it became um, cattle trails or, you know, uh, for shepherding animals for it was farmland. Uh, and then it got settled. Um, there's a uh, kind of it ripples out from the core of downtown. So we're just on the periphery of downtown Minneapolis. We're the northwest edge of that. So we live our area is closest to its own as the warehouse district. Um, and mi the Mississippi River runs through our city and was where we had a lot of industrial uses back in the day, a lot of flour mills. So we technically in North Minneapolis abut the Mississippi River. However, um, you know, two or three blocks from to the west of the Mississippi River, they put an in interstate. So we have Interstate 94, which kind of blocks us off on the eastern border from getting to the river. We have uh, kind of two more highways that bisect us to the south, Highway 55 and then uh, Interstate 394 um, that kind of keep us bordered from hit, you know interacting with our neighbor, Southern Minneapolis neighbors to the south. And then of course, to the west, we have the suburbs, but we also have this great parkway system, but we also have freight lines that cut us off from the parkway. <laughs> and then to the north, we have another suburb. So. We're kind of a little bit landlocked a little bit. The architecture itself um, on our historic main street, we went through that urban renewal phase in the like 60s and 70s where um, a lot of old, you know, 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s buildings got demolished in the name of progress. We had a lot of strip malls get put up. At this point, there's really only about three contiguous blocks of historic street front that are really left uh, along the, our major commercial corridor. And I I point that out only because it was one of the caveats that the neighborhood, um, we have four different, so I should say Minneapolis is heavy neighborhood centric. So we have like over 80 different neighborhoods in Minneapolis. North is like the quadrant that encompasses a number of them. But the um, three neighborhoods that border are West Broadway Avenue um, came together in that steering committee and said that they really wanna preserve that. They don't wanna see those get demolished because we already have enough stuff that got demolished. And once stuff got demolished, we never saw the economic benefits that were touted to supposed to be coming from this urban renewal. Uh, and so um, in terms of housing, we have closer to the core is a lot of um, 1900s Victorian. And then as it rippled out farther north, we used to have um, trolley cars back in the day. So as it went farther north, um, you saw more smaller, more modest bungalow, Tudor, um, more blue collar houses. So a lot of the bigger Victorians were old merchant houses um, that either operated off West Broadway or operated downtown. And then as it went North, it was more um, working cottages. So as, um, and then of course, there's also a section of ours that was a 1920s subdivision. Uh, so a lot of the houses are from that era as well. Uh, and it was a mixture. It was a lot of small density, single family homes, but also some duplexes. Um, and then interspersed with that, like a nine-plex apartment building here or there or whatnot. Um, we do have a few multifamily, um, like uh, higher density developments. And um, a, cor a little corner of our world uh, was a subject of a lawsuit um, involving concentrated poverty on swamplands uh, back in. Um, and so those got demolished, I want to say about, oh gosh, I'm going to get this wrong, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, maybe even more, more recently than that, 20 years ago, maybe. Um, and that was the Sumner Fields uh, project. And that was because of the Holman decree. And so then we saw those areas, they put in a drainage system and put in a mixed income development there with a mixture of densities uh, around surrounding parkland and, you know, uh, this, that, and the other. So that's another area of our city. But by and large, we have the same uh, concentrations of single family homes as you would see in any other area of our city, actually. It's, it's a misperception that, um, we had higher density than the wealthier areas of the city. We actually, if you look at the map, uh, the last zoning map from 
you know, before we initiated our recent comp plan, um, it's pretty much universally spread out, you know, in a very consistent basis throughout our city. So, <clears throat> but you did see like when we had that urban renewal phase, when we had a lot of um, real estate, speculative real estate investment, we saw a lot of the bigger Victorians get bought up and cut up into tiny little single room occupancy units. And then when those became blighted because they were poorly managed and there wasn't a lot of good regulation around them, they got torn down. So we saw a lot of that embodied energy get destroyed. And then a lot of weird infill from the seventies and eighties get put in. So we have these weird split levels next to these grand Victorians. It's a weird mishmash. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really weird. So, um, but having said that, a lot of the older houses were built so soundly that they are actually still high quality housing stock and are really ripe for um, rehabbing, which is why we have a lot of um, local ownership of those buildings because people invested their time and energy and money into the community to maintain those in recent years. So it's kind of, this is kind of these waves where people are, you know, and, and we had, I should say during um, the sixties our one of our commercial quarters, which was Plymouth Avenue at the time, you wouldn't recognize it as a commercial corridor now, but there were riots in the sixties, um, race riots, and it got burned to the ground. So a lot of that is either still empty lots today or, um, it's never grown back really as a commercial corridor. Um, we didn't see uh, the reinvestment into that. And, but after that, we did see a lot of white flight out to the suburbs, um, which left a lot of uh, homes kind of, you know, uh, some, some people took advantage of it to stake a claim and have an ownership, but a lot of it was absentee against speculative investors, rentals, those kinds of things. So we have these different waves of investment and disinvestment in our community for different reasons. If that makes sense. Yeah. Your, your, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're against investment and disadvantage, or probably large scale investment, maybe, and disadvantaged communities. And, and I want you to explain um, to me and uh, the audience that why is that and how is that harmful to these communities? Sure. So, so what actually, what concerns me is that um, a lot of our municipal policy around helping areas like my neighborhood um, involve a lot of top down, we're going to tell you what you need solutions. So, and usually they're not very nuanced. It's you need this, this is the solution that, you know, uh, for all it was, the, the answer is uh, home ownership. We need everyone to own a home. Uh, the current wave is home ownership as a means of building generational wealth is dead. Uh, Rent the new to affordability tool is rental. So everyone needs to have rental property. So it's, uh, or needs to rent from rental property. And I think that both of those are actually wrong. I think that what's missing is that what people really need is the opportunity for choice. Because in reality, people shouldn't be forced to stay in a community if they see opportunity elsewhere, but they also shouldn't be forced to be displaced if they wanna stay and that's where their support structures are. But we don't really give people choice with the way we plan our cities um, and not even, how we, I don't think anyone in the city is sitting around going, how do we concentrate poor people together? I think though our policies constantly perpetuate the same historic redlining that we saw that was so detrimental to our communities, you know, a hundred years ago through today, we still are having the effects of that, but we haven't done anything to change it. Like we had the Fair Housing Act of, of, as part of the civil rights movement before I was born. And yet the same um, subsidized housing patterns that we replicate today mimic those same geographic boundaries, almost as if we never had the Fair Housing Act pass, passed at all. And that was that's done by people who are, um, in theory, proponents of the Fair Housing Act. So you can imagine the bad players are probably doing even worse, right? So we don't give people the choice of whether they want to stay in a community or go. They're kind of at the mercy of wherever we put the housing that we tell them they have to live in. So so by and large, I think that if people, a lot of people that I know, and I'm you know, speaking anecdotally in my community, uh, want to own homes. They want to have a place to put down roots. They want to know that at the end of the month or the end of the year, they won't have to risk leaving and finding someplace new. So their, their children know the same people around them and go to the same schools and have the same infrastructure and understand their place in the world um, in terms of here's where I live, here's, you know, this is my neighborhood. You know, that's what they, they want to have. They don't want to feel like this is mine until a landlord kicks me out. At the same time, there's also people that are like, I don't want to own a home. It's a ton of work. It's a ton of time. And it's a ton of hassle. I want to rent. I don't, you know. So you have this mix of people. And instead of forcing everyone into one box, we need to kind of expand opportunities for choice. Now, my problem with 
investment property isn't that we shouldn't have rental because I actually, like I said, there's a definite need for rental. My problem is with absentee investor uh, coming into neighborhoods like mine uh, and pretty much um, squeezing every dime out of uh, out of our community, both uh, structurally and from uh, and from the people living here. And the, my observation and um, it, it has been that local landlords tend to see their tenants as neighbors because they are neighbors. I mean, they see them as human beings. If they lose a job or their car breaks down or you know this that or the other, um, in general, they tend to be the landlords that are more understanding of, oh, your rent is going to be late or, oh, you missed a month or, oh, this happened or, you know, any number of things that really, um, you know, your car breaks down and it's a $500 tab to fix it. For some of us, that's a big pain, but for some people it is catastrophic. So, you know, these are the landlords that tend to actually see these renters as more than just a commodity. Um, if you have a large corporate landlord though, it's all about the dollars. You can't make your rent, we're gonna start eviction proceedings. And that's just the way it is, right? So it's one of these snowball effects. Um, and I don't think the answer is to put these one size fits all slapping every every landlord with the same policy outcomes, because in general, those tend to really penalize small time landlords over um, large corporate entities, you know. And so I am very suspect of policies that promote absentee investment without safeguards to prevent exploitation. So it's, it's not an anti rental um platform that I have, I guess. It's an anti-exploitation platform. And it actually is a denial of opportunity. So for example, um, part of the reason this came about is because um, as part of our most recent comp plan, um, our planning department, along with our city council, who was um, whose president is an urban planner, um, decided that their claim to fame would be that we would be the first city in the country to eliminate single family zone. Well, we weren't. We got beat out. But it was our baby first. We came up with it, well, you know, whatever. So um, I remember the meeting when this got brought up, I was in the executive committee meeting with um, our president of the planning commission and you know, some planning people. And the planning department pitched this idea. We're gonna, we're gonna eliminate single family zoning and allow universal upzoning up to four units on any lot in the city. And I was like, oh, that is so interesting. I mean, it's interesting to think about, right? Like we hadn't really thought about that, talked about it, seen it done. Um, and of course, because I live in North and I've seen the way that people exploit other human beings through um, land ownership, I said, well, you'd really, you need some safeguards to prevent exploitation. <clears throat> and the woman who pitched this idea said, well, yes, obviously. And we are actually currently uh, toying with the idea of having an owner occupancy requirement. And I said, well, oh crap, then you, you're fine because the odds that someone would treat the people on the other side of the wall, like complete garbage, <laughs> is so much less than someone who's in the uh, not even in the same zip code or state or even country, right? You know, they, you, you have to live with these people. So you don't want to treat them like garbage. It's just basic, it's common sense. It should be basic human decency, but I don't think we can rely on that anymore. So as it progressed through though, it, it's not as clean a message to say, yes, we'll do this, but asterisk, safeguard, safeguard, safeguard. Um, it was it was viewed, and I'm paraphrasing here. This is not the official uh, narrative that you will hear from our city. But it was it was it was a messier thing than to just say we freed Minneapolis from these oppressive bonds of single family zoning. And so what you saw, or what you probably saw marketed, because we had a massive PR campaign about it for our city, um, was maps that showed my neighborhood. <laughs> look at look at here's where historic redlining took place. Look, look where these racial covenants were in their city that prevented people from living in these other areas. So they had to live in places like North Minneapolis. Look at how those places are underserved to today. We have crappy access to green space. We have crappy access to public transit. We have horrible hospitalization rates for asthma because our air quality is so bad. We, you know, every metric that you can point out to point out how we have still suffered as a neighborhood because of these practices is totally true. And every map looks the same. It doesn't matter which map you're looking at. They all look the same. And you can point to these historic practices as being likely one of the, the instigators, if not the cause of all these things. It was a seed that developed and grew this fruit. It's all the same. Every map's the same um, for these things. I and mean, even through to the subsidized housing locations, because of course you put it where land's cheap, where's land's cheap, where, where crap sucks and no one wants to live. Where does that happen? Oh, here. Same area we forced people to live in before, right? It's all the same. The only map that is not at all the same and is entirely different is our single family zoning map. 
every other one you overlaid it same 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 you get to this one it is not the same map at all you you wouldn't even know what it was but the way we marketed it was that this was going to be the great equalizer that this was the finally writing a historic wrong and it seemed odd to me because in reality all of those historic wrongs if you think about um redlining well that was a lack of regulation where we let banks basically force people uh, to not get mortgages in certain areas and have to live in other areas based on their skin color or ethnicity. If you look at racial covenants, that's again, a lack of regulation where we let people put things on deeds that prohibited people from buying certain properties. So I went, but if the, if the root cause is a lack of regulation of these two industries, why did we suddenly unregulate zoning? Like that seems to be like that is actually contribute. It's, it's going down that same path that we just we should have learned a lesson about. If anything, we should be going, why are we still concentrating poverty in the same neighborhoods and not giving people choices to live anywhere else? I mean, if we only build subsidized housing in the same communities that were historically redlined, we're giving that same denial of opportunity and choice to those families today that people did through redlining 100 years ago. It's the same practice with a new name, right? So so that was that was the gist. Well, because it got touted as this big, affordable housing if we it's a, it, and and the and the saying is it's a supply and demand you make enough units of course it'll impact demand and make things more affordable the thing you'll never hear mentioned is well how do we know like what's the metric how are we defining affordable like so we build more units what does that mean does it mean that all of a sudden the price of building something will get cheaper does it mean that the cost of buying a house will get cheaper does it mean that the cost of renting an apartment is cheaper does it mean that we are paying 10% less or that we're serving a different AMI, like what makes it more affordable? Like it, they, they'll say it's simple supply and demand. And I would say, well, that's, that's trickle down economics circa the Reaganomic era. We all know that failed. So how does it work? Like, I, I honestly wanted to know, like, it, and if it works, what's the tipping point? Like, so let's say you found a metric that this is the measure for success. This will equal that and define that, which no one ever has. Um, What's the magic number? How many units do we need to create to tip the scales to finally make it a big affordability free for all? Right? No one's ever said. And and you're you might risking saying the opposite because it might in, it might increase the the prices, and you'll see yeah. people selling and just leaving, and it's going to be too too expensive for people to rent, and then. Um, Wealthier people would move in and you'll see what we call gentrification, right? Or well, yeah, and what we're what we're seeing is because it became a, a, a density at all costs. So density was the goal. Instead of just being a tool to achieve certain goals, all of a sudden the goal was density. Um, because of that, it totally ignores what our affordability needs are. So instead of applauding meeting certain metrics to define whether or not our policies are a success, um, it became just a simple mathematical measure of dwelling units per acre. Did we increase dwelling units per acre? Then check, we moved closer to the bar because we reached higher density. The problem with that is that it equates all affordability needs as being just a matter of units. Well, the thing that I can tell you about North Minneapolis in which I'm just astounded that people are so unwilling to consider this is that in my neck of the woods on the last census, we learned that over 50% of my population in my neighborhood is under the age of 18, which means half of our population are children. They're for parts of families. And a majority of our community is not only cost burdened, they're severely cost burdened, which means a humongous chunk of their income goes just to paying housing costs. Flat up, right? So Given that we have families who have a huge cost burden and we already know there's not enough housing that's family sized, when you all of a sudden take a property such as a bungalow that used to not be as appealing to an investor because if you have a one unit building, a house, and you have to replace the roof or the boiler or the windows or whatever, you have one income stream to offset that with. If you, however, are able to take that same building and slice it into three units, you have three income streams to offset that with. So here, for example, in my neighborhood where people have been saving for years to have a down payment to buy a house, maybe their first home ownership in their entire family history. It's, it's quite realistic. Um, they might be wanting to buy a modest 1,200 square foot bungalow. 
perfectly awesome little house um, that they can raise their family in. Probably three bedrooms, maybe even two baths. Um, and uh, instead of competing against other first time home buyers, we just uh, opened the floodgates and said, it's a free for all. You're not competing against uh, John Doe next door, Jane. You're competing against absentee investor portfolios from across the country. And guess what? They have cash and they're going to outbid you every time. And that's exactly what happened. And so you can take a 1,200 square foot bungalow that would have been family sized, a family sized unit with three bedrooms. And all of a sudden, if you, as long as you have 350 square feet per unit, which a 1,200 square foot bungalow does, you have a triplex, but you have a triplex of three efficiency units. So those are one bedrooms, not family sized. So our greatest need for affordable housing is for families. And yet we just actually took another unit off the market. So we actually put a tighter squeeze on the very type of housing we should have been encouraging, but we can claim it's a success because we upped our dwelling units per acre from one unit in that building to three. So it's being applauded as a success, but if you look at the real human impacts in my neighborhood, you're displacing families whose support systems might he be here, or quite frankly, this is the one neighborhood they could still afford to live in. And the thing that we've observed then in the last five years is that the average cost of a house in North Minneapolis has almost doubled, literally almost doubled in five years. It's gone up everywhere in Minneapolis as it's gone up many places. It's a hot real estate market. However, it is almost doubled. And on top of that, our property taxes here, because we have speculative investors driving up the neighbor's house down the block, the this, the that, outbidding people, our city assessments, because they deem our property values increased, have led to increased property taxes here. So while other areas of the city might have seen a very modest increase in how much taxes they've paid through property taxes, our neck of the woods has seen 15 to 20% increases every year for the past five years. So people on fixed incomes who bought their houses, have lived here for 20, 30 years, have all of a sudden found that they can't afford to stay because the property taxes, the very thing regulated by our local government is not being held in check. So here we talk about displacement and preventing gentrification and about caring about people of color and severely cost burdened families. But all we're really doing is increasing the rate of displacement, displacing people that otherwise were in stable housing and providing more absentee investment, which then they might say, well, yeah, but it still tips the scales because it's still more units. The problem with that though, is remember we're severely cost burdened. A majority of the income in this community goes to landlords. So the first of every month, if you don't have a local landlord, that means we have a massive capital flight of all that rental income leaving our zip code. And because of that, we don't have the income floating around the community. Normally a dollar floats around seven times, right? We don't have that. It comes in and then the first of the month it leaves. So we can't actually have jobs on our commercial corridors because there's no disposable income floating around to support those jobs, which means we are perpetually as a city and state and county subsidizing those commercial corridors to be able to have the basic amenities that other areas of the city take for granted. When I did a map of our three major commercial corridors pre-COVID, and I found places that weren't fast food that you could get dinner at, there were a total of four. Four total in our entire quadrant of the city on our major commercial corridors. The other major commercial corridors in our city have probably four per block. So it tells you when we talk about there's a, a lack of amenities in our community, I think people, yeah, 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 oh yeah, you're a poor community. I don't think they realize the realities of it. When we went through civil unrest and our grocery store was looted, we did not have a grocery store. We did not have a pharmacy. People had to be bused out of the community to get basic needs. We had people dropping off donations and community members distributing them. I mean, I will say our neighborhood's very tight. We look out for one another here but it doesn't help when we can't have that complete community, that, that healthy neighborhood that, that we're supposed to be wanting to get through these walkable communities. You can't have it if all of the disposable income is leaving at the first of every month because a majority of the properties where people can live are owned by entities who don't live here. And now we see a massive rush through investment portfolios to swoop in and buy all sorts of housing. I mean, I think, what is it? 20% of the housing in this country is now owned by um, absentee investors. I mean, th that means they have a monopoly on the market pretty soon to where they can control it. So it won't even matter if we generate a million new units. If they have their hand on the faucet spigot, we're not going to see that tipping of the scales because it's an artificial market. 
So that's in a nutshell. <laughs> that's why I'm so um, opposed to these policies without safeguards. It isn't that I'm anti-density. To be honest, you need a certain level of density and it's a tool to drive certain things. It's it's a tool. It's not a goal. It's like, like I always say, it's a hammer. It can build a house or smash a window. If you don't, if you just push it as a goal, you're not going to necessarily get the house. You'll just get a bunch of broken windows, right? So density is great. Density is needed. I think people who are afraid of density need to chill out. However, you can't just have it be unfettered where it's a free for all because all you did was push people out of the market who should have had a, you know, be able to put down roots. And you're driving up the cost of housing because it's completely uh, a manipulable market. So in a nutshell, that's that's my concern. It is an anti which is weird. People want to make it all or nothing. It's it's not a it's not an all or nothing issue. It's a nuanced issue, just like affordable housing. There's no silver bullet. And anyone who wants to sell you, tell you that there is is selling you a line of goods. You know, if it were that easy, it would be. And quite frankly, you can look. Nothing's gotten cheaper here. We've had a single family zoning allowed now for a year and a half. You know, nobody's saying, well, nobody in the community is like stalling the virtues of it. I mean, nobody's saying this is great because it's not, it's not at all. And there's no metrics to define success. So of course there's no metrics to when we know to just declare it a failure either. Yeah, kind of a I follow some investment groups and always surprises me to see like they buy a properties for incredibly cheap prices mm -hmm. and then the rent is not that a big of the percentage of the rent is very similar to what i have here as a luxury apartment in boston and it's not the exact same but it's pretty close but the the, the price of the property is like I don't know, ten percent, or it's, it's it's very like you you buy a property for thirty five thousand dollars, and that to me is incredible. And yeah. I don't know some it, probably Ohio or some other states, and then they rent it for um nine hundred dollars a month for a for one unit. Yeah, well, it's how can that be? How, how can that be? I'm just well, it's people who are, I mean, quite frankly, they're taking it, well, a few things. They're taking advantage of people who are going, oh, I'll, you know, things are happening, or maybe grandma's getting old, who knows, whatever life circumstance they're in, and they offer them cash. It's cash, it's guaranteed, you don't have to fix up your house, we'll buy it from you, we'll take care of that, you can go live wherever with this cash you have, you know? Um, so it's that. It's also just finding houses that are on the market and going, if we control enough of this, we control the market. So we can buy houses, whether it's on the cheap or even at market rate, as long as we basically get enough of them under our belt, we can control what the cost of renting it back from us will be. Because, I mean, like I said, I don't think people should be forced to own. I don't think everyone should be forced to rent. I think that it's it's one of those things where people have choices. They should have choices. But in reality, if you think about what it takes to own rental property or to rent from someone, you have to you're covering the cost of the mortgage, the cost of property taxes, the cost of maintenance, and you're covering the cost of their profit. So, I, and, and I don't think that it's a bad thing they make profit because it, it is one of these things where you do have to reinvest in it if you're doing it right. The trick is the people that are doing it right aren't making that much money off of it. They're doing it to stabilize their neighborhoods. The people that are doing it wrong are wringing every dime out of it and letting the property completely go to decay because they know it takes a decade of really, really bad behavior and conditions to have anything happen because ultimately they know they have the tenants hostage. What are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to shut the place down and evict their tenants. The tenants will be homeless. What cities know that the landlords have them over a barrel that way. And be like, Oh, you're going to kick out these poor people. At least they have a roof over their head here. Too bad that the sewage is leaking in the basement, but now they're going to be homeless. I mean, they have no qualms because they don't see my neighbors as human beings. They see them as dollar signs. So even our worst of worst of worst slumlords, it takes, I would say, a year, no, I'm not a year, 10 years of litigation to get them remotely removed. And then they just transfer to some new entity, some nephew, some uncle, who knows, or they sell it off or they just wring every dime out of it, walk away and leave the city with this crap hole that's going to cost $30,000 to, to demo. I mean, it's the ultimate, like, scam if you think about it but i can't believe our city is dumb enough to keep falling for it like we have not figured out to target the slumlords and we've never sat down with the good landlords who tenants like and say what are you doing right and how do we emulate your practices 
Instead, it's all these, how do we penalize landlords? Not realizing if you do want rental property as an option, you have to have landlords. It is a thing. But how do you encourage good landlords and not bad ones? And you, it has to be a carrot and a stick. And unfortunately, we have these really people that'll think that there's only two dominoes in the row. And in reality, it's a chain of dominoes. You can't just go, well, I knocked over the second one. We hit that one. And you go, well, yeah, but that knocked over 20 dominoes after it. Is that the outcome you really wanted? And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of people that are willing to put the energy into critical thought to go, okay, this sounds like a good idea. What are the possible unintended consequences of this? Or what are some also possible benefits of this? How do we weave different needs together to solve multiple problems at once? We need to be working across departments. We need to be talking with um, I mean, our county, our state. We need to like cut down on the redundancy and get really efficient with this because every year we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars and yet we never see a change in the outcomes. I mean, that's the shocking thing to me that nobody's willing to step back and go, why do we keep playing the same record? Like we're not getting smarter. I mean, and maybe it's the architect in me because I like to think we're critical thinkers and we have to balance such a myriad of different factors to come up with, you know, there's no the solution, but there's a best solution. How do we not have those types of thinkers at the table? And how are we totally content with the status quo under a new name? I mean, I call it the classic, it looked good on a PowerPoint. That seems to be the bar we need to cross. It looked good on a PowerPoint. It made for a good soundbite. It got us a good article in the New Yorker, who knows? But if no one's asking, but how do you measure success? What's the metrics? What are the numbers? When can we reach there? What are your projections? How do you know if you failed? How do you know if you, I mean, nobody's asking those tough questions. I mean, how do we spend millions of dollars promoting an idea and there's zero data and accountability behind and making sure it actually doesn't. And you know what the reason it does or doesn't is because the people crafting the policy are ultimately not living in the neighborhoods that will be most impacted. So if this went, if this succeeds, great. If it fails, who cares? Because they don't have to put up with the consequences and outcomes. Their heads are not laying on pillows in my zip code. And because of that, they can play free and loose with it because they're not in the trenches. I mean, and that's the reality of it is you don't have people at the table who actually have a stake in the game. You have people at the table that rather make a statement than make a difference. And at the end of the day, that's how we got here in the first place. So we're not going to get anywhere differently. And it just bums me out. I mean, I, I think that's an understatement of the year. It frustrates the daylights out of me that we can't get anyone to actually say it's hard work. It's going to take this, like this is what it'll take. And we all have to work toward this goal. And here's how we're going to measure if it works. And guess what? If we're checking our data regularly and we're not tracking with this, we got to fix what's wrong. I mean, you wouldn't put together a car not knowing how all the different engine components work together. Yet we do it all the time with city planning and these are human lives on the line. Definitely. Definitely. So, so if you, if we get those legislators and the city <clears throat> do ask you to, to give them a plan or at least come up with, I, I know you probably don't have all the answers or maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> if, if you were in charge, what would you do? Oh, well, if I was in charge, well, um, I would do a few things. I, I mean, obviously, I don't know. Uh, for being about transparency, we don't have a lot of open books here in our city. We don't, they don't share a lot of information that isn't already spun a certain way. But I think what I would do first and foremost is find out what real data we're working with. Um, I think that anyone who starts with a solution and tries to backpedal into a problem to justify it is, it needs to go. So I would say, first and foremost, we need to look at what we're actually dealing with here on the ground. Um, for example, we have opportunities all around us. We have over 300 vacant lots in North Minneapolis alone. And all we've done is stick cookie cutter houses on them that we give a five-year incentive for people to buy. And then at five years in one day, they move. So we need to look at who's still there. Why are they still there? Who moved? Why did they move? We need to kind of start doing a post-mortem on the programs we've done to understand why they've succeeded, how they succeeded, or why they failed. Because we've never done that. Uh, we just keep kind of like promoting these ideas that are really good warm fuzzies, but we, we, don't, we don't need people's good intentions. We need results. So I would start with that. I would start and go, what are the behaviors and the outcomes we want to have more of? 
How do we craft policy to promote those? What are the outcomes and behaviors we need to make sure we don't ever have again? How do we craft policy to stop that? And then how do we make sure those policies can coexist? Because that's, in my mind, the problem is we don't, we don't understand that there's two sides to every coin. Um, so for example, if I, if this is my one, my example of how this could work in action. So if the solution really is density, which I, it's not a goal, but it's also, it's not terrible. It's just, it's a thing. Um, why, why do we not put safeguards in place to say, yes, we need density, but we need density that's not going to screw people over. So here's how we're going to do it. So for example, using those 300 vacant lots in North Minneapolis as the example, what if we said, okay, we also know because we've finally listened to the residents of areas like North Minneapolis that have been telling this for years, stop shoving the same cookie cutter plan through for all the affordable housing. They, they all look the same. One is special, two is okay. 24 of them is nothing great and no one wants them. You know, like no one wants to stay after they've aged. So I would say, well, okay, we have these interesting communities. Remember I talked about earlier, there's Victorian areas, there's these crafts and bungalow areas, there's these Tudor, these, our neighborhoods have different characters to them. And every neighborhood in Minneapolis, whether it's North Minneapolis or elsewhere, is proud of their neighborhood. Everyone. I mean, it's this weird thing. I don't know if it's everywhere on the country, but our neighborhoods are very proud. So you would say, okay, we're going to look at these 300 lots in isolation of each other, kind of, and also analyze what are their characteristics? What's adjacent to them? What are their feet? Are they on a corner or are they in the middle of the block? Are they surrounded by cute little bungalows or are they surrounded by really tall Victorians? What's near them? How close to a park are they? How close to a bus? I mean, what can, what's ideal for this site? And then we're going to actually approach architects, not random drafter person who lives in the burbs. We're going to approach architects, different ones. We're going to approach, I'm going to make them up, five architects. And we're going to say, we're going to commission each of you to design two different fourplexes. And P.S., these fourplexes will not be the same unit replicated four times in a row. We want a fourplex that has and be a three bedroom unit, an efficiency unit, a two bedroom unit, and a one bedroom unit, all in one four plus, or whatever, you know, whatever mishmash of units. So it's not just the same generic crap. The, the problem with our neighborhood is that people always put crap in and then it looks like crap or they put good enough in. And the problem with that is good enough is never good enough. You need great to be perceived as good here. So uh, because not only are you doing it for the residents living there, but you're doing it for the neighbor around, the neighborhood around you who has to look at it for the next 50 years because we don't get perpetual reinvestment. We get this one thing and that's it. So here it is. So we say, okay, we know that, for example, this lot on the corner could, could be fourplex A or C. Those are the two design options. And the one empty lot, two, two houses down, if, if the corner lot's A, then that one cannot be A because we are not replicating the same design on the same block. And neighborhoods have asked this for years. I know one neighborhood that made a rule that you could have no more than two of the identical houses in a quadrant of their neighborhood because they were so tired of seeing the same cookie cutter house put everywhere, right? And then we're gonna say, okay, we know we have local residents who have been saving for years and going through our first time home buyer classes they're trying to become first-time home buyers. Jane Doe with, I don't know, your three children. I'm making up a person here. We are gonna, we're gonna build you a fourplex if you want. Because here's the deal. We know that you've been screwed over from owning a home. Your parents were, your grandparents were. You've lost off uh, out on that opportunity to build generational wealth and have something to have equity. So maybe uh, send your kid to college or I don't know, get out of debt or whatever. I mean, the, You've lost that. You haven't been offered that opportunity. So if you want this opportunity, we're going to build this for you. It's going to be designed by an architect. So it's actually going to have some character. And because we designed it by an architect and we know the exact building material list on it, we can track the market. So we're not getting kind of held over a barrel by all these speculative contractors who know that they have a, a contract that's backed because it's subsidized with city funds. We will say, this is the cost of materials. We will pay X percentage to a, as a contractor fee. And, we, and if we don't find it, we will hire a city contractor to be building these things. Like this is absolutely absurd that we give all our money away for profit when we know exactly how much things should cost because it's it's in there, right? We have plans. So so Jane Doe, we're building you this fourplex. And at the first of every month, one and a half of your units rent. And I, this is where you'd have to have economists, which of course we didn't have. You need to have economists who are working out these numbers. So I'm giving you generic numbers that I'm estimating, but you'd have to be fine-tuned. For every month, one and a half of those units rents goes straight into a bank account to pay us back. That's covering the mortgage, essentially, the cost of construction. Boom, right in an account. Another unit's worth of rent is going into an account that you can access to make repairs because guess what? Things go wrong in houses. A roof leaks. The plumbing goes out. 
whatever, something happens. And usually if you're a first time home buyer, when that $7,000 estimate comes in, you might not have that hanging around. I don't know a lot of families that have seven grand or whatever the cost is to make a repair, but you'll have it because it's a rental property and you have to maintain it. You're going to have it in this account because it's already going in there directly. And then the other half a unit that you're renting, that's your profit because guess what? You own an income earning property now. You make a little bit of money. And then your unit, well, you don't pay rent on, but guess what? You used to be paying rent to someone else. So now that's money you have in your pocket. So instead of having $1,300 leave every month, you have $1,300 you can keep, spend, save for college, uh, go on vacation, buy a car. I don't know, whatever you want to do with it. Get a bunch of tattoos. I don't know, it's your money, right? You have that now. Right. So you're not making money off your unit, but you're not spending money on renting a unit. You own that unit. And at the end of 30 years, we'll have either paid ourselves back as a city and we'll either say, thank you. We made our money back. Good and good. And these neighborhoods now have really great design houses that are not all cookie cutter. This person has an income earning property that actually not only gives them the generational wealth of owning a home, but actually income earning, accelerating that lack of generational wealth. Uh, and on top of it, we could either perpetually redeploy that as a city or just get our money back and say, well, that was a great success. We filled in these empty slots. They're now back on the tax roll. We made uh, up for some stuff that we did horribly wrong later or, or a long time ago, not fully, but we started. And uh, it didn't really cost us as much as all the money pits we keep throwing stuff in now and never getting any results out of. There's one example where we could be like, win, 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 win. Uh, and then also, P.S., Jane, you're not being displaced because you own the dang place. And if you want to keep it forever, great. If you want to sell it, it is all fourplex. That's worth a lot more than a single family home. If you lose your job, which happens with people who get first time single you know, home homeowner things that they own a single home, you might be screwed. You might not be able to pay your mortgage. But guess what? If you lose your job while you're living here, you might be a little bit tight between trying to find a job, but you're not going to lose your home because your mortgage is already getting paid by the unit and a half that's paying the rent every month to pay us back for building it. So we pretty much upfronted the pre-development cost, the construction, all these things, and delivered a quality product, not saying that you had to like scrounge around because you didn't have pre-development funds. You found some random drafter who maybe has a CAD program, but has no concept of how human beings interact with space. You have something great that you can hand down to your grandchildren someday, or just sell and go live in the Bahamas. I don't know, whatever you want to do, because that's what homeowners have a little bit of freedom to decide what they want to do. They have choice. And so that's what I would do. And that would be just one thing I would do because in reality, we could look at every problem we're facing that way. It's like, how do we not only make this solve one thing, how do we make this solve a bunch of things? And how do we eliminate the negative outcomes? And here's the thing. If after 30 years, we did not get paid back 100% of the cost, I bet you it's still cheaper than the millions of dollars we pour into affordable housing initiatives every year. Like, I'd be willing to say we could eat a fine chunk of that and we'd still come out ahead. And, and on top of it, we'd be employing con contractors and a GC and we'd be having our finger on the pulse of uh, the cost of materials as supply chains ebbed and, ebbed and flowed. It wouldn't just be how we happened to get a bid at a certain time and someone threw a high number because they didn't want really the project. Now they're doing the job kind of half-assed. We would have our finger on the pulse because we would have very tight plans with very tight material uh, 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 orders on it. So it's one of these things where there's a million ways we could be more efficient with our money, our time and have better outcomes for every, for human beings. Uh, but we haven't done it because it takes a lot of work and it takes a little bit of, uh, you know, working with other departments. And that's also not as glamorous. I mean, let's face it. It took me probably 15 minutes to explain that it's much more messy than just having a, we eliminated single family zoning. We universal up zone. We saved, I don't even know, Minneapolis from the death throes of I mean, whatever. I mean, it's it's definitely not the same, you know, it doesn't have the same sound bite quality, but it, I can guarantee you it have better outcomes. So there, that's one example of what I would propose doing. I just, if we just had someone with critical thinking and willing to do the hard work and make people be accountable. And then you'd have metrics. Is this working? Are we, are we getting the houses built? Are people happy? What are they not liking about it? What are they liking about it? How do we update the plans, you know? So on and so forth. I mean, there's there's different ways where you're ensuring quality at every step and good outcomes. And you'd have to test that. Because the thing too, here I'm pitching this idea, you need to have ways of critiquing it along the way. I mean, I pitch it, it sounds great. I need to know as we're deploying it, if it's not so great. Like you need to have ways to correct a plan, uh, you know, because nothing's nothing's perfect. You can't anticipate everything, but you should anticipate more than we're anticipating. 
And that's, I think the biggest problem is there's these really obvious, uh, I don't know, meteors coming at us. And instead of doing something about them, we're like distracted with a ladybug on the ground going, well, at least we're covering the ladybug. Never mind when the meteor hits us, it's going to squish the ladybug anyway, you know? I don't know if that's a really good analogy, but you get the gist. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. And I, I think that's a great idea. So do I. I wish someone would do it. I've only presented it to, I don't know, um, the mayor's office, a bunch of our city council members, some nonprofit developers. I mean, it's interesting to me um, because I don't know why. I mean, I actually, well, this, anyway, we won't go into it, but it, it's like, I, I wish people actually, they care. I, I mean, that's thing I will tell you, it's not that people in our city don't care. They just don't care enough. You know, I mean, I always say it's when I first joined the planning commission and I will tell you, my neighborhood is very skeptical of city initiatives and intentions and what's going on. And with good reason, because they go to a million meetings about how to improve the neighborhood. And after every single one, they get something put in front of them. That's nothing like they asked for. Uh, they don't see themselves reflected in it because it's designed for them, uh, regardless of whatever they told them they actually needed. And I used to say, and they say, oh, the city hates us. The city, the city, you know, it's always the city is this capital C. The city hates us. They don't like us. They don't, you know, they're trying to hurt, you know, all this things intentional. I say, no, the city is not sitting there trying to screw us over. But I will tell you this, the city is like an aunt or an uncle when we are like, we're like the redheaded stepchild, if I can say. I don't know if I don't, I don't want to offend redheaded people. Glorious hair. But uh, where we say, hey, uh, auntie, when we grew up, I want to, I want to be a doctor. And they say, oh, that's really sweet, honey. Have you thought about secretarial school? And they think, oh, I'm setting them up for a good career because that's, they're going to be better than they are now. And in reality, all they're doing is not realizing our potential and not believing in us. So part of me is like, if you can't back us, get out of the way. I mean, our biggest barrier in our city actually is people's lowered expectations of what we're capable of being. And the sad thing is we have codified that through our policy uh, to the point where we are literally replicating the same historic redlining inequities of 100 years ago still today. I mean, literally, you can overlay the map. It is damn near identical. And nobody wants to be accountable and go, holy crap, we are sucking at this. Like, I don't know. I think I'd be the first one to be like, hold up. I'm making a living trying to change this. Why am I replicating it? We should change things. Um, but I don't think anyone wants to really have a critical lens on themselves. And unfortunately, we need to. I mean, it's OK. We're all human. It, it, admitting that you made a mistake or that something you thought would work isn't working is is OK. But unfortunately, you know, there's this perception that if you remotely admit that anything that you did was less than perfect or maybe you didn't do your due diligence well enough. Um, that somehow it's worse to admit it than just to correct it. I, I don't know. I, I I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but it's, it's a perpetual state of disappointment with humanity lately is the fact that we're unwilling to just actually make sure that our intended outcomes are the intended are the actual outcomes. Yeah. I want some accountability, dang it. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. So there you go. There's, this is what keeps me up at night. <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank you. That was a it was mind blowing. I, I would, I learned so much and oh, yay. yeah, I learned so much and I am not sure how to think because when I hear lectures, I hear them from the city and nonprofit and the, the investors who are helping the city to do that. But, um, I'm not sure how it's working, but I, I know that Boston is not investor friendly, or it's one of the least investor friendly uh, towns. And I assume that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Be, having investments in your neighborhood is not a bad thing. But the question is, at the end of the day, who is benefiting from it? Are they providing a service that outweighs their benefit? Or are you setting yourself up for in 30 years, we're going to have no opportunities because all of our money is leaving. So, I mean, I'm all for local investment, to be honest. I'm all for helping, you know, I know one of the neighborhoods, I've lived in three neighborhoods in North Minneapolis, and one of the neighborhoods I used to live in, their stabilization strategy from literally the decade I was born in 
was when there is a slum property where an absentee slumlord is running it into the ground, they would, and they live, you know, a block or two away, they would buy it. They would buy it and they would repair it and they would rent it to someone and they would never sell it because there was their block stabilization plan was, well, if we live here in this house and we own that house, we know that those are two houses that can't be taken advantage of by some large. So those people can live in dignity. And if our neighbors all do that, if we all buy one, that, that was their plan. And over the decades, they have achieved a level of stabilization that some of their nearby little neighborhoods have not. So, but again, that takes having some disposable income, which, you know, obviously we're starting from an area of inequity. So we need as a city to address that and say, hey, obviously that's nice to say, but not everyone, most people can't do that, especially now when we have just made it a free for all for investors, absentee investors. So how do we carve out opportunities for local investment ourselves? Because if if we really wanted to just, you know, prevent displacement, how do we encourage local investment, which is the opposite of displacement? How do we encourage local ownership, whether it's ownership to rent to other you know, local neighbors or ownership to own and live in yourself? If it's local, at least the dollars are circulating locally. You're treating the person like a neighbor. It's hard to be a total jerk if you have to face that person every day. I mean, really, honestly, it takes, and not that it's perfect because we're still human beings, but the percentage wise, when we looked at the data on problem properties in Minneapolis, we have a, we had a three tier problem property list. Tier one's like, hey, you're okay. Tier two's like, wow, you have a bad property. And tier three's like, dear baby Jesus, I can't believe human beings live it. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. That's not how they officially, but that's kind of the gist of it. Bad crap, right? Repeat offenders, not whatever. When you look at it, North Minneapolis is 17 and a half percent of the land mass of the city. Yet we had over 40 percent of tier two problem properties and over 40 some percent of tier three problem properties. So we're this much of the city with almost half of two tiers worth of problem properties in our area. And if you look at those problem properties, like 74 point something percent of them were owned by entities outside of our zip code. So that tells me we don't have a problem with rental property or landlords or home ownership. We have a problem with absentee investors treating human beings like garbage and running the housing into the ground and not getting held accountable. And that's because we don't hold them accountable. There's no real tools to hold them accountable. And we haven't bothered making any that aren't just a one size fits all, you know, penalize all landlords, which is not also a solution. So it's how do you get savvy and craft policy that does what it's supposed to do without, I mean, you wouldn't just, I think of it like, like the drinking bleach thing during COVID or hydrochloroquine. You wouldn't just say to someone, we'll take medicine. You would say, well, you want to take a medicine that will, you know, cure your disease, but also not, you know, cause you to go blind and lose your kidneys. Like you, that's, that's, that's how doctors and pharmacists decide on the medicine you need. What solves your ill without making you sicker, you know, but we just seem to be like medicine, you know, I mean, consequences be damned, you know, and half the time we're not even sure if that medicine is going to cure the thing that's wrong. So that's the thing is it's, it's not just about investment. It's because we do need investment. You can't, Quite frankly, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you don't have boots, right? So we do need investment, but we need investment that is smarter and more savvy and more targeted and allows for more local control and ownership over the outcomes. And that is not what we're seeing happening at our city. So, and I would, I would argue that we're not seeing that anywhere in the country. So we need to get people that are smarter. I mean, my God, surely some people are smart enough out there to craft policy that is nuanced. It, it shouldn't be that freaking hard. Can I say freaking? I don't know. Anyway, here, I just said it. Sorry. I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm thinking back to where do we get investors cooperate with architects again? How, how do we have? Well, how do we, we need have, to. How do we change the dynamics from architects over? The past decades changed, became order takers rather than advisors, and you know, help the two of them. You know, so there's there's a real disconnect here because um, ten years ago now, actually, uh, we had a tornado go through North Minneapolis, and it did a massive amount of damage. It was horrible, and uh, we actually um, another local architecture professional and myself, and another one who 
another architect who grew up here, but doesn't live here currently, but live nearby. We, we co-founded this pro bono design relief effort. And um, on our first meeting, we had, um, we ended up having like 80 design professionals, I mean, engineers, architects, students, volunteer to be on these like design task, like task force groups to go out and address people's needs. And at the first meeting, we had two architects show up who argued that uh, North Minneapolis, and I should say, they're not from here. They're not from North Minneapolis. They argued that North Minneapolis does not need architects for this. They need basic things like food and water and that we shouldn't be wasting our time designing things for them because that's not what they need. And I got really upset because again, it was that lowered expectation. I, because in reality, what people needed was to have those drawings and tools to argue with their insurance companies to say, no, I had divided light windows before and I should get divided light windows now. You shouldn't be able to rip me off by specking some plastic piece of crap casement window when my house had, you know, divided like double hung, you know, windows instead, or no, I had a front stoop or front porch that looked like this. You don't get to just price out a deck because those are how we see these little things chip away at the character of our neighborhood and people, because they are not as um, financially able to afford an architect. Like most people in my neighborhood uh, would not, their first instinct would not be to hire an architect. They'd hire a contractor because they they, are, they, they don't have the disposable, it's viewed as an extra perk. It's something you do as a luxury, right? But in reality, design is for everybody. And in, in fact, I would argue that communities like mine are more in need of quality design than the ritzier areas of town because we've been the most robbed of our architectural heritage over the years. Salvage places, crappy repairs by some lords, things like this where insurance companies come in and they cut you a check. So they're doing it based on this lower quality thing that in no way replicates the quality that was taken out. Um, things like that. So number one, there's that. Number two, we need city policies that stop acting like architecture is somehow this unnecessary extra. I mean, literally we had a design or not design, a housing, an affordable green housing program here in the city a few years ago. And they asked for people to put together their own developer teams and pitch houses for vacant lots. Well, their scorecards actually penalized you if you hire, had an architect on your team because it was considered an unnecessary expense. Um, because the city even do well it's just a house it's better than what they have now we don't need it to be something special ergo the cookie cutter houses that the people in the neighborhood have repeatedly said we're tired of seeing the same house please stop building the same house we had these really great amazing you know even even the sears catalog houses from long ago there was a variety of them we do not have that variety now we see the same there's the 1990s version there's a 2000s version there's a 2010 version it goes for about a decade before it peters out and there's a new sh crappy version that's out there and it gets just replicated to death and so we need as a city to say we value design because not only does it matter for the inhabitants but it also is something that impacts the neighborhood for years to come so ironically enough like i mentioned before our city started out with elimination of single family zoning uh, and universal upzoning to fourplexes that was the initial pitch well one of the council members leaked the story to the press ahead of the timeline. There was a PR campaign timeline and it made him scramble and people got all in an uproar because of course change is hard. And so it wouldn't have mattered if we had safe, people freaked out in the city. And so the city backpedaled and said, okay, actually we'll do it. We, we heard you, we listened. We're not gonna do four plexes, we're gonna do three plexes. We're compromising. Well, I was chatting with a planner and I'm actually, I feel really stupid to say that I had not realized this at the time. And I said, wow, um, I'm kind of, uh, you know, amazed that they actually, you know, changed it to triplex is that that's kind of, I'm not used to them being that responsive. And the planner told me, oh, Alyssa, it was going to be triplexes all along. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Like I was in that executive committee meeting. No, it wasn't. It was fourplexes. I said, oh no, we knew we'd say fourplexes, but we knew that the moment you um, have a fourplex, it triggers the requirement for an architect to stamp the drawings. And we knew that, um, spec developers won't want to do that expense. It's probably like $30,000. So we knew they would opt to do a triplex every time. And I was like, what? You knew they would, and, and I'm not saying architects always provide quality, but by and large, architects bring quality and uh, to a project, in my opinion, just through the design, because they understand how human beings inhabit space. And I said, so intentionally, you crafted a policy that would allow people to have less quality designed buildings in their neighborhoods, knowing that it would impact certain neighborhoods more than others. And it would have to be there for the next 30 to 50 years because of the embodied energy that went into those structures. 
So, that, so one of the safeguards I promoted was why don't we have universal upzoning that's either single family, duplex, or fourplex? There's no triplex option. None. It's it's one income stream, two income streams. If you want four, you got to hire an architect. Uh, that went nowhere because, of course, they wanted the three option because they wanted people to build the units because it's all about maximizing dwelling units per acre. It was not about providing quality housing for people or permanent housing for people or affordable housing for people. It was just about maximizing dwelling units. So, so yeah. So until we actually get people on at the city to understand that design is for everybody and not just for wealthy residents of the city, uh, we're going to run into this problem a lot. And uh, unfortunately, uh, people in communities like mine have been told you don't deserve design. You don't deserve like we'll give you design, but really it's this cookie cutter piece of crap. Or maybe we'll slap some new paint on it. They haven't been told. Um, yeah, the thing you want isn't some extra luxury. It's it's the basic. It's a basic thing that anyone should expect to live in dignity is to have a space that's designed for a human being and not just a bunch of boxes on a plan. So. I was not, I'm curious, have you ever discussed that in a, in a, like your local AIA chapter or something like that? Yeah, um, yes and no. So I have done some presentations um, locally. I've been asked to speak to some firms. Um, I was, I'm trying to think how much of this I covered in an AIA um, Dallas uh, housing summit that was just this spring. Um, as you notice, I tend to go off on tangents. So I'm not sure what I, tangents I went off on there. Um, I did meet with an architect from the West, through Zoom, through the West Coast, who was doing a, uh, setting up a series of um, online curriculum uh, about single family upzoning. And I think he, he was anticipating that I would be singing the praises of it. And he was not too happy when I was not. So um, even though we said we'd stay in touch, he has not reached out since because I was not delivering the message he wanted. For example, his argument was that we should um, provide a set of like 10 different stock plans for ADUs. That way it's, you know, blah, blah, blah more affordable. And I, I said, well, the, the problem with that argument is that it's not the architect that's making ADUs not affordable. ADUs just are not affordable by nature. They are all of the expensive square footage and less of the cheap square footage. So in reality, ADUs are probably the most expensive thing to build per square foot, period. It, the architect's fee is not going to make a damn bit of difference. In fact, the contractor's getting paid more to oversee the construction than the architect got paid to design the damn thing. So in reality, if we want to make them more affordable, well, you, you just can't. It is just the cost of what the market is. I mean, it is how anyone pitched that as being an affordable housing solution and convinced anybody they did it because it was the density issue. Oh, we're adding density, so it's cheaper. Never mind that it's, you know, I don't know, 180% of the cost. I don't know. It's insanely more expensive than if they just built a, a house twice. I mean, I always say they, everyone thinks it's a quarter of the size, it's a quarter of the cost. It's a quarter of the size and 80% of the cost. There you go. There's my little, uh, I guess, TED talk on ADUs. They're cute. They're adorable. I love them. I think they're a great feature. I think they add to the urban fabric. I'm not against ADUs, but they're totally not an, an affordability tool. So, and it's certainly not the architect design fees that are keeping it from being an affordability tool. So to just argue that just actually argues for monotony and design uh, when a GC is going to make twice as much as it would have cost to draft the dang thing anyway. Yeah, from, from a design point of view, the smaller it is, the more difficult to solve design yeah. problems. And if, and you're spending all this money, you want it to be efficient, you want it to be, yeah. You so I, I I didn't see absolutely. where that would have made any difference. I was like, I, I you, you're giving away something that didn't need to be free and it won't impact the outcome. You just you just told people design really doesn't matter, which in reality just undermines the communities that they are supposed to be serving. You know, if you treat design as an afterthought, then don't be surprised when you get treated as an afterthought as an architect. You know. I, don't know, I, I always say I could do a slideshow of, you know, I think I told you I've decided on over 5,500 land use applications for the city of Minneapolis, and I could do a slideshow with no addresses or project names whatsoever on them. I, I wouldn't even need to know the name of the architect that did it, although I probably could tell. Um, and I could tell you in a slideshow of facades, which are the affordable housing designs and which are market rate designs, because they look different. There are definite tells, and architects know it. But 
average citizens also know it. They may not realize they know it, but you can tell when you're driving through a neighborhood that has those buildings to go, oh, this is a poor, poor area versus, oh, this is a high end area. They look different. They look different. They're cladded different. They're designed different. And they are different, which is why the AI even has a different award category for them, because we know that affordable housing cannot can compete with market rate housing, even in design. If it did, we wouldn't have separate category. So, I mean, we need to stop lying to ourselves. We design inferior things. When it comes to affordable housing, we put our B and C teams on it for firms. We don't put our A team on the affordable housing design. We don't use the highest quality materials because then again, it's also a race to the bottom. Developers go, well, if I use cheaper windows, then I can build more units. Well, here's the thing. We've never just, we've never built our way out of a housing crisis. We've never housed everybody. We're going to have homeless people, but instead you put in a product that's going to fail much sooner and be a much less durable to a community that has no maintenance cost or money to fix it. So you can either do it right the first time for a little more money, or you can pay the cost for decades to come for a lot more money. And unfortunately, you put blight on that community in the meantime for the next 30 to 50 years. So I would rather we all roll up our sleeves and advocate for more funding to do it right and be high quality and be designed well up front, which is hard. It's an uphill battle. I'll give you that. But if all of us came together, if architects, engineers, housing developers, nonprofits, anyone who claims to give a damn about impoverished human beings all came together and said, this is the cost of doing it right. And then we did it right. And we delivered a product that actually provided housing that was dignified for people. I think we would in 50 years look back and say, wow, we made much more of a difference than we thought we would have, or than we did before. than if we just keep pumping out cheap crap and then wondering why we never seem to get ahead. So that's my, that's my other soapbox. I guess I have quite a few soapboxes about housing and people. So there. Melissa, I really enjoyed talking to you, and I think we're going to have another interview <laughs> in a while. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed talking to you. I'm sorry if I kind of go off on a little tangent, but I'm, I'm obviously, I mean, I literally don't understand how people can be so short-sighted when people's lives are literally on the line. I mean, this affects every facet of their existence, and and especially this last year, I, I think about those one better efficiency units and families and families not being able to find, afford affordable housing and find affordable housing. And I think about being stuck at home distance learning with my kid, with my kids, but my one kid especially. And I think I cannot fathom if I had more than one child in a room with me trying to do distance learning at the same time as I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to afford grocery. I, I don't know how a single family, a single parent household in a one bedroom apartment could do it and not lose their minds. I mean, it, it, it's hard enough to parent as is, but you keep adding burdens on top of it. And then we do other things. And so we should talk later about parking and whatnot, because as much as I think we definitely need to batten down the hatches and go green, uh, our car policies actually also uh, tend to screw over the poor in our community and uh, deny reality of how people have to exist. So there's smarter ways we could do that as well, but we don't do that because it's not as clean, again, of a, as a PR campaign, but mm. People, why can't we just help people? <laughs> sure, and that's what we're doing, I think, I hope. I hope so, I hope. I hope people do. I mean, I think the, the, the good intentions are there, but like I always say, it's not that people don't care, you just need to care enough. So that's my new motto. So again, thank you so much. And that's been amazing. And I'm, I'm positive we're gonna have another interview. <laughs> awesome, cool. <laughs> 